Okay. Hello, 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 everyone. I have got the amazing, wonderful, amazing, <laughs> brilliant, fabulous Rupert Morgan here with us today. <laughs> and um, for those of you that have joined the call before you know the deal, but for anyone that is new, um, feel free to put your questions in the chat box and I will, don't worry, I will see it even though I look like I'm not seeing it and I will put it through at a good time in the conversation. Quirky questions only. If you can find something out on Google, then just go to Google. I, I don't want to like learn. I want to have fun. We've had a nice meal. We're sitting around the table with an amaretto and a coffee and we're dissecting the world and life as it is and sharing each other's energy, which is how I like I think we learn more from hanging out with each other than from workshops. Um, so I have ulterior motives for bringing Rupert on. I'm going to just do a tiny quick introduction here. Rupert, when I met you, I'd reached out. I'd been doing some voiceover and burlesque and any weird thing I could do that would piss off my corporate boss. And like, I'm an actress. I don't need you. And I reached out to you because somebody said, oh, you could do audiobooks. I've been listening for years. And you said, come in for an audition. And I remember, I remember every minute of it. I remember the audition. I remember what I did. And I assumed I wasn't going to hear back. And you called me back and you said, you tell a good story. You're a little bit fast, but that's normal. You know, when somebody's just starting and you tell a good story and those four words, you tell a good story stuck in my head for, I think the first three and a half years, I don't think you realize what an impact you have on people when, and it was like, oh, okay, Rupert, thinks I can do it and, and look at him, you know, he's quite, quite impressive. You go to the studio and, and I remember also telling you, I think like on the third book, I'm going to be an audiobook narrator. I, I do remember, I think you might've had like a little bit of a worry behind you. <laughs> I hope she doesn't quit her day job immediately. <laughs> But I said, and I went outside after the first book on the street outside your office and like called my friend at the corporate place. And I was like punching the air, like screaming, this is what I'm going to do for the rest of my life. <laughs> <laughs> and it's because of the experience you set up. And I would love to ask about 10 year old Rupert. Who was Oof. he? Where was he living? What was he thinking? What wow. were you planning life? Were you... What, who were you at 10 years old? Who was I at 10 years old? Um, well, thank you for that amazing introduction and saying I'm amazing several times over. I'm, I'm really not, but thank you anyway. You are, you are. Who was I at 10? Gosh, I was a little fat kid living in Wales, um, wanting to be a football journalist. Um, that's kind of all I cared about at the time. Um and reading, 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 as you know, ten-year-old boys did who wanted to do something with the arts. But as I say, it was—I think I probably wanted to write the great novel, but I knew I was never going to do that. I was fascinated with football, soccer, as you would call it, perhaps. And um, yeah, so uh, that's who the ten-year-old Rupert was, um, wanting to be a footballer, rubbish at it, couldn't kick a ball Aww. the same way twice. <laughs> so instead, I thought, well, I can write, I can do that, I'll become a journalist. That's what I sort of aimed to do for most of my time. I went to uni to, well, study English and the idea of becoming a journalist. Then I sort of did it for a while and went, I don't want to do that. I want to do something else. I want to do something a bit more we out there. We didn't hear about journalism at 10 years old. That's a, It's like a first one, first for me. I, I know, but I think I'm a very sad individual, basically. I used to, I used to sit and read, I used to read the, the spreadsheets, not even the tabloids. I used to read The Guardian copiously and just dream of being a journalist writing about the football <laughs> when you were 10 nothing else i didn't care about anything else just the football there you go not sure that was the answer you expected but yeah that was the 10 year old me i think dreaming that's of, brilliant dreaming of getting out of mid wales and going somewhere else but yeah, is mid wales my roommate used to be from swansea is that mid wales a bit further north than that so aberystwyth which is right on the coast 
lovely seaside town, but when you're a 10 year old, you dream of going somewhere else, don't you? I think. Yeah. Probably yeah. most people do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so you go on. You, so it sounds like everything is going according to plan, college, journalism. When did you end up taking a turn from that? So I took a turn from that. Um, as I say, I, 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 I did a bit of um, a bit of football journalism. I was working, I did some, some uh, trials on some of the newspapers and then thought, do you know what? This isn't for me. It's not, I didn't want to be writing about something i wanted to be enjoying that something and it was a case of right let's hunt around and that's when i thought right okay i'm not going to be a journalist what am i going to be i didn't know um i'd done some recording work when i was at college i'd done some some other things i saw an advert for an audio production assistant i think it was called or something at the time no what was it a studio assistant that was what it was and um turned out it was rnib um, looking for somebody to come in at, at, to do talking books. And that's when I started my career. I started with them 30 years ago. I moved away. I came back. I've done other things too, but but yeah. So R&IB, not to pin it down, to not part. to do the numbers, but like around how old were you when you joined RNIB? Not to do the numbers. I'm not trying to like age. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, 20, 23, 24, something like that, I think, you know, so yeah. Yeah. Did you fall in love Quite with it good. or was it just a job when you started? No, no, actually, I fell in love with it. Well, yeah, pretty much straight, straight away. It was a great team. You joined this team. It was doing something that was different. It was doing something else. I was, I, not, I think other friends of mine who'd left uni had got other, you know, that people had gone into work. But I, I seem to remember it was around the time when there wasn't a lot of work around as well, you know, things, things happen and I was one of the first out of my lot to get a job and people were going, wow, that's amazing. So that was exciting in itself. Yeah. And then joining this team of people who were excited to go into work each day because they loved the books, they loved the people, they loved trying to get the best out of the, the narrators. And suddenly there was this whole new world. And I was like, wow, okay, this is, this is interesting. And then there was this other side to it, which was also this huge thing for me. It was helping blind people yeah. get access to, to literature. Um, and, you know, it was something I hadn't necessarily considered before, but as soon as I started, as soon as I saw the letters that came in from, from RNIB Talking Book members, the, the library members, who talk about it literally being a, a lifeline, you know, an absolute, um, so if, particularly to people who had lost their sight maybe later in life and thought that they'd lost access to, to literature and, you know, their love of books. That and was suddenly, me. I lost 80% was... of my vision. That's there you go. I had a brain tumor. I didn't know about. Wow. wow. I lost yeah. almost all my vision. I listened to audiobooks. I yeah. listened to audiobooks, and they were a lifeline because without there you go. them. Exactly yeah. that. Yeah. It's that lifeline thing. And so, so suddenly there I was. I was working. I was enjoying life. I was living in London. I was a young man, you know, all of those things that, that you do. And there's also this sort of every day getting this, this feedback from people saying, well, wow, look, what you're doing is really making a difference to my life. And, you know, and that has carried on, you know, not necessarily for, I'm not talking about for me, look, how everybody, anybody who works with the RNIB Talking Books service, the studios, the library, everything that feeds into that goes to help our members enjoy the wonder of books, you know, and that's, that's a really important thing that we do, that they enjoy, that they feed back to, it's great. You know, it's, uh, it's R&IB family in that sense, you know, it's great. And the underlying message that comes through so clearly is quality. Because I remember yeah. just not knowing what I was doing and the editors yeah. and just unbelievable, unbelievably yeah. professional. Yeah, yeah, I know it's important. So so what our, our, our sort of standpoint is about quality, yeah. you know, obviously, you're going to miss. Sometimes it doesn't always work as we would want it to work. COVID was a challenge as it was for everybody, you know, all those things. But no, our fundamental starting point is that we need good recordings, quality recordings with brilliant narrators. The narrators are the lifeblood. Without them, we're nothing. The narrators are so important. And, um, you know, and it has been a, a sort of a testing center, a test bed for some narrators. You bring narrators through, you know, people complete novices. Equally, we get people who are very experienced wanting to be involved. There's not much money in it. You know, um, 
the talking books pay a very small amount compared to what people can get commercially. But it has been for some people a chance to, to start in the business. For other people, it's um, you know a chance to give something back. Lots of people come to us for lots of different reasons, and um, you know, but only the the best get through, and through the audition come through. It could be that you know they're on a learning curve and they will get better, and that's lovely in itself. And so some of the earlier recordings. They might look back and go, oh, I could have done better there. But that's part of that learning process for everybody in every kind of situation, isn't it? I think. But you can't and, you can't listen to it, can you? Is it still that way? You can't. Listen no, it's still. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, yes. When I say, you know, if you did listen back, yes, you've got to be a member of the uh, RNIB talking book library in order to access our books. But then, of course, we over time when we started I mean not, not to get too boring with it I don't know how far back you want me to take it but you know RNIB was the only show in town to begin with it started the idea of, of audiobooks so the talking book service started 85 years ago whatever it was possibly longer my dates could be wrong and they were the it was the first time that audiobooks had ever been thought of as an idea um, and it was ostensibly to help people who had been blinded at wartime to get leisure material and and other information, that and so long back ago. in the, oh yeah yeah so wow. back, so back in the day it was a very different concept. The idea was that it was recorded on um, on disc on shellac discs, and the discs I believe lasted for twenty five minutes at a time, and so you needed to record continuously for twenty five minutes, or else the disc was ruined and you'd have to throw it away and, and start again. So in those days, they used um, newsreaders, um, people who were used to sort of talking and changing the message just slightly because they might be, you know, a new piece of information that might be put in front of them literally as they're talking. And so a lot of newsreaders were, were part of that, that forefront of the creation of the talking book service. And in those days, so the idea was you kept talking even if you weren't quite saying the words that were on the page, but you were saying words that were approximate to the words that were yeah. on the page. But obviously, as we move forward, as recording technologies change, there's the ability to, um, to, to you know, change how the recording worked and to make sure that, you, obviously, we then needed to concentrate more on sticking to, the, <laughs> sticking to the words that are on the page and making sure the interpretation of the words that were on the page comes through. You know, obviously, we're there to interpret the author's work that's what we and you, the narrators, do collaboratively. And I do believe, I genuinely believe it's a collaboration. I hope anybody who works with studios sees that collaboration. You don't get, we have what's called audio producers. So our in-studio team, they're the audio producers and they're brilliant. You know, they're, they're controlling the technical element while at the same time following the book, while at the same time, trying to make sure that you, the narrators, are saying the words in the right way and in the right order, but with the right intonation, with the right pronunciation. They, they, you I know, have to put my hand up. Can... Sorry to interrupt, but they really, really do. Yeah. And because the whole thing is when they say, oh, you've got a director on this book. The thing is, you don't often really have a director. They don't have time to be a director. They're just they're just making sure you don't flub the words or, or you know, burp yeah. while you're recording. But um, yeah. My experience with RNIB was as much as they could, they really did in real time direct as much as they could. And and yeah. um, Kim has a question. She says, was it ever recorded on reel to reel? Yes. So when I first started, good question, Kim, I started on reel to reel. We were so again, not to be too history bound with it all. But in those days, I mean, obviously, RNIB charity side of things, we had to keep costs to a minimum. So what we would do in those days was record um, on reel-to-reel uh, -reel on quarter-inch tape. So basically you're recording one way, you turn the tape over, you'd record the other way. So you're recording on both tracks in mono of the reel-to-reel -reel tape. And I can see Kim nodding away there. Yeah, it, 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 that's yeah. what we did. And um, so it meant that we got four hours of recording onto a, onto a, a single reel-to-reel. Um, but it did mean that we couldn't record, uh, we couldn't splice edit in any way. So we recorded what's called rock and roll. So that's the method and we still use it. It's useful for two reasons. So it, it and it, the rock and roll simply comes, but it's not, it, it sounds exciting. It sounds like 
you know, you're out there, you're you're groovy, whatever, groovy. Look how old am I? But um, but uh, come back in again. That phrase. Yeah, 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 maybe it has. Maybe that's what I'm <laughs> down with the kid. But rock and roll, it was simply you you you, you would rock backwards. You so you would stop the recording, you would rock backwards. So take it, rewind it backwards, and then roll forwards again. And there's your rock and roll. Is so that what punch? we would do that, is that punch and roll. Uh, punch and roll. It's the is same as punch that and roll, but, but that's but it was rock and roll back before it was okay. punch and roll. That's your digital. That's your digital future that made it punch and roll. But yeah, it, and but what you would of course have to do was um, uh, pre uh, roll so that you so if the narrator had, had flubbed somewhere along the line, you'd clear a path for them to pick up. So you'd have to do a pre roll, and you'd have to judge where to come in so that the, the, the tape heads erased what you didn't want and you, you didn't erase the stuff you wanted to keep. And then you'd have to rock back and roll forward again and bring the narrator in either with a sat with an audio cue, so the fold back method where they're actually hearing what they're saying. Some people didn't like that, so you'd actually have to bring them in on with a light. So you'd be literally dropping in and hitting the light at the moment that you thought would give them enough response time that they could pick up. And it worked remarkably well. I mean, it would be, you know, if you listen back to some of them, you can hear tiny gaps, a tiny hesitation sometimes, but in the main, you don't hear it at all. It just took a lot of skill and a lot of working out. Then, thank heavens, digital recording came along and we didn't need to worry about that anymore. But yes, so, um, but we would sometimes, if you if if we had recordings that were multi-handed, so that you had many narrators on the job, yeah. you'd record that um, on uh, uh, in at a, a slightly higher speed on the the tape machine, which would allow you to a slightly higher quality recording level, so that we could then splice everybody together. So literally, with a, you know a, a chinograph pencil and a blade. And so splice. are we talking like the difference between 24 bit and 16 bit? Is that what you mean? Yeah, essentially. But 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 back in the day, it was uh, you had three and three quarter ips, seven and a half ips. It was inches per second, basically. That's how <laughs> old I am. I can <laughs> remember when things were recorded in inches. And uh, so yeah, it, and it comes down to to yes, exactly that that sort of quality level and what and and what degradation you could have. And the reason we needed that was that we then um put the final master got put onto an eight effectively what was an eight track cassette and so there would be a degradation in in sound quality so you needed the higher level in order to degrade down so that you, when you lost you still ended up at the same exactly level. so when you lost you still maintained a, a good a good standard can and I those diverge sorry. us in a second yeah um, yeah of course only because um I've got a big crucial question that I know that most of the people in the audience are going to be wondering about. And then I've also got a question from Sarah. Sarah says, where have your native Welsh tones gone? Do they only appear after a <laughs> pint or five? That's right. That's <laughs> lovely. Yes. Now, where I'm from, Aberystwyth, Mid Wales, um, there is an accent, but for some reason I never really had one. And it, I, I tend to pick up accents wherever I live. So I lived in the Northwest for a long time. I had a very different accent. So have you when I talk about it? No, I am a dreadful narrator. I would make an awful narrator. I get to be one of those people who sits on the sidelines and, and says where it's wrong rather than, you know, do it myself. But um, but I, 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 don't, I don't know. I have the ear, yeah, and, 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 I, and I, you know, not to blow my own trumpet on that, but I genuinely do. If, if something sounds wrong, it clangs like a bell, you know, and, and that's where you need to go back. And it's great. So, you know, I, I wouldn't say I could director play i'm not a director of actors but i am a director of narrators and i do know what sounds good and what doesn't and and i think i'm pretty good at being able to or got good over the years of being able to pass that information on to people in a way that that allowed it to be that collaborative thing i mean i can't stress that enough it is collaborative with ultimately you know a, a lot of actors um don't necessarily make good narrators a lot of narrators don't necessarily make good actors and some are both you know there's a whole um collective of people and so some of those people are incredibly creative but when it comes to narration audiobook narration we become the interpretive artist the the creation is already there by the author the author created it we we didn't um but then we need to interpret their work 
in a way that we see fit, if you like. Not necessarily calling them up and saying, how do you want us to read that? Because what they felt when they wrote it might not be how they feel about it now even, you know. But, but at the same time, we need to produce a, a well-read, interesting tale that engages the listener, that doesn't overtake what the listener's own interpretation might be, if you like, you know, it allows everybody a, a bit of room to breathe. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Narrators, you're all amazing. You know, the fact that you can do those things is great, you, but you sometimes you can get it wrong and you need to guide you back. I'm, and I'm gonna, I'm sorry I keep interrupting you, but so many things that's you okay. say keep sparking new questions. But you made me realize something. You hold, what you said about you being able to hear it like a clanging bell if it's off, if it's not right. You have like the confidence and the, the ear and you know you do. So it's like a quiet kind of confidence. And I think that's yeah. what I sensed because I, when I met you, had gained a lot of weight, had a horrible corporate job, had lost mm -hmm. my confidence as an actor. I was still showing up on stage, but my head, the voice in my head was all about, I'm fat. I'm, I, and I'm sorry if this triggers people these days or something but that was my reality at the time as an actor a lot of it is about how you appear and show up as and you had quiet confidence and space and in just a few words were able to tell me yes you can do this and I think that's why it was so profound because you holding that space open for me allowed me to get rid of the worries and the, all the self-criticism and hold the space open for the book oh well brilliant i mean that's great that's so lovely to hear because that's exactly what it's meant to be you know we need we need you the narrators to be confident in what you're doing and, and as i say some people new people come in and you know they don't even know where to start sometimes you know that there's the you need to prepare you need to be ready to be in studio you need to know the book you can't just turn up and go what's this about then you know and hope to be able to do a good job so we the producers need you the narrators to have already done that work to know how you're saying things to know how things are pronounced if you've had the chance to look into those things to at least have a good excuse me a decent understanding of where you're going with this because without that then we're we're trying to start from scratch and that that will never work um so you know you the narrators need to have done your groundwork and then that gives us something as producers that we can can help with you know we can say that's working that isn't working could we try this could we maybe make that character a bit more sympathetic so that the the bit at the end where that suddenly comes through isn't such a, a massive shock, you know, whatever. Can we drop some of the character voices? It does, you know, sometimes people use character voices too much. Sometimes there are caricatures in books that need to be lifted. You know, every book is different and every book needs to breathe in its own way. And it's important also that I think, um, well, no, I don't even think this, I know this, I, well, I believe this, that every author created their book to be read, to be enjoyed. And just because they may, a, a book might feel a bit generic and it might be, oh, I'm reading another one of those. We, we can't approach it like that. You've got to approach every book as give it the respect that it deserves. Yeah, you have to honor author. the work you're yeah. doing. Or exactly. Don't do it. Because if you don't, it sounds trite. It sounds like you're phoning it in and there is nowhere for anyone to go with that you know the, the audio producer might be sitting the other side of the glass going right i don't know how to breathe life life into this so that's why i say it's collaborative it has to be collaborative and and you know and it and you are the interpretive artists and we are there to help guide you okay so next question um because i i mean because in my mind there are a few things about the rnib it's the the quality i did the days of anna madrigal i would never have gotten that book i probably couldn't get that book now you know what i mean <laughs> unless i mean i can yeah. get public domain books that aren't in copyright but the quality of the books that you have access through working with you guys is is next level oh well, i mean you get other books as well but you get a chance to work on books that you might never get a chance to work on you do get paid i mean i know you say it's less but you're still you know you're getting yeah. some money and you're doing this yeah. amazing thing you're putting it out there and 
I heard a few years ago that you, I have two, a two part question. The first part oh. is since so many people have started working from home, have you found an uptake in, but don't answer this one yet. Let me throw them all at you. Okay. And you can have, I'm curious as to if you've noticed an uptake in skills, i.e. marking up before. And because now we're used to doing self-producing and the people that have worked consistently have become kind of, you know, really good at all that. Has that yeah. come across in narrators when they go into the studio? And then the next part of the question is, are you still, okay, this is, are you still having people work from home? If so, how does that work? Are you actively looking for narrators to join? If so, how does that work? Where are you now for somebody? And also the America, UK thing. So maybe about, yeah. could you please answer those 30 questions? Those th 300 questions in, in 15 seconds. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I'll see if I can even remember them all. But yeah. Okay. So um, I'll, I'll go with the, the actively seeking one first, even yeah. though it wasn't it was out of order. Um, actively seeking, no, not actively seeking, but um, like a different charity like Bernardo's never want to turn the people away from the door. It's people can, are very welcome to get in touch with me always happy for them to, to email and say, I'm, I'm interested in becoming a narrator. I am a narrator, but I'm keen to do more, whatever it may be. Um, there is an audition. Uh, you, you, you may not get through the audition. You know, there is an audition. I have already somewhere in the region of 400 narrators on the panel of narrators that I know, trust, can go to, will select books forward, cast to. But, you know, there are um, areas of diversity that are missing from that panel. I've been trying to build up. Therefore, there are newer narrators coming on to the panel, some of whom have no experience at all uh, and need to be developed. Some of whom have their own home studios and have, you know, invested into this, this idea of being audio book narrators and therefore are um, several steps down the, the road already, you know, if not already complete, the complete um, thing, yeah. being, whatever I'm trying to say. So um, do people, are people better prepared? Sometimes yes, sometimes no. They're people, people do different things. Some home-based narrators who've perhaps done just self-op work and haven't necessarily done studio-based things have fallen into their own way of working that it can Ooh, be a do little tell bit, any bad you know, habits we should stop <laughs> a, little, some, a few bad yeah, maybe some bad habits you know so not uh, maybe become i don't know because you don't have a, a first set of ears saying ah that's a bit over the top let's try let's take that back a bit let's rethink that character if you're doing it you know if you're doing it in isolation then obviously that of course, things like that will happen. And, and so if somebody's then become very successful doing that and that's become their their thing, their shtick, if you like, you know, the, you know, they are the, the, the narrator that does big characters, then maybe that's it. Maybe there's no changing that because that's where the audience yeah. for that person is. But at the same time, there are you can always, you know, try other ways to look at other things and, and just see where we can go with those things. But yes, mostly people who have their own studios know how to prepare generally. They, they know not to waste studio time. They know to be marked up. They, they've done their prep. They've got an iPad or whatever they have. A, tab, a tablet device, I should call it, shouldn't I? Not advertising one particular brand. <laughs> um, but, you know, they, they, get, they used to get in scripts electronically. They've got something to read from that they are happy to bring to studio that they have marked up using some sort of annotation device to be it however they want to do it some people mark up with a thousand colors for all the different characters yeah, some people me. do very minimalist and just have a slight pencil mark you know whatever it, it is i don't mind i ha i couldn't care what your preparation is as long as you have prepared because <laughs> if you haven't you haven't really brought your all of your skills to the table if you like and um but 
But equally, there are people who are new and needing to learn or thinking they, they know what they need to do. And we can talk about that. You know, we can say, right, OK, you do need to prep. You do need you need to have read this book through. You need to know where the characters are going, why, why this needs, why this passage needs to be a little slower so that you can build to that crescendo, why you need to understand that if you, if you make this person sound like the killer here, you've given it away on page three where the, you know, the reveal didn't come till page 363, you've kind of spoiled the book, you know, those sort of things. And those are just little tips and hints that, that new narrators hadn't necessarily even thought about. But, well, do you um, think, I, I really firmly believe maybe it's because that's how I work. I think that even if you are a home narrator, everyone should have studio experience. If for nothing else, yeah. that you record much more in the studio. And I think you need the experience. Yeah, I agree. That, so. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, then, and, and there's room for everybody, but the but stu the studio experience still needs to be, you know, people do need to have that. And that's we're very fortunate. We've got the real estate in London and we have a studio. We're so fortunate to have that. We have six studios that people could be either made. You asked the question about the home recording and I haven't forgotten it, I promise. Uh, so our studios can be um, either doubled up as person to person studios or made into a sort of remote hub. So if people don't have a home studio that is of a, a decent quality, and you know, it's important that a home studio is of proper quality, it's got to be soundproof, got to have a good mic, got to, you know, have all the fundamentals. Some people will go, oh, I've got a, a little room and a, and a duvet. And, you know, it, it <laughs> things work, things work and they don't work, you know, it depends. But what we found with lockdown and people thinking they had a, a, a good enough space and then the rain started and yeah you can hear the rain or you can hear the, the the car or whatever it happens to be so you know obviously there's there's that so is what is a home studio and some people have good and some people have slightly less good but there are ways of making it work but if but we do have a quality um, requirement with ours and, and so if we audition people we also audition the studio, if you like, and if it doesn't make the grade, then we say, look, we can work with you, but you've got to come to London, you've got to come to the studio. And then what we do in our studio space, as it currently stands anyway, things can change, things will change, um, is that we can either pair the studio, so we've got a producer the other side of the class, or we turn them into remote hubs so the narrator comes to the studio, but the audio producer might be somewhere else in the country. We've got um, studio space in Gateshead as well, and we've got the use of places in Cardiff as well. So we've got a real mix of things going on. Yeah. Wow. And we try to keep it as mixed as possible as well so that we we give people the option to do the work that works for them, if you like. You know, work, sorry, work in the way that works for them. So what about working from home? How does, is it just straightforward? You assign the book, they deliver at a certain time, no direction? No, we tend not to. We 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 prefer not to work that way. So um, our mainstream when we're remote recording is we um, have uh, IPDTL as an option. So there, there's also Source Connect. There's other routes, but the but some of those routes require people to have a license at the other end. It's not fair for us to say to a narrator, go out and get a license for a job that we might not even employ you on. You know, so yeah. IPDTL which isn't perfect, sorry, IPDTL, if I've said that, if it offends anybody, but IPDTL, which is an amazing thing, an amazing tool that allowed, it's basically, it's an internet protocol that allows the recording to happen over the, the web. It does require that the, the, the narrator has a hardwired studio at home. You can't do it over Wi-Fi. Um, so it, if you've got a, a home studio and you've got a, a way of, um, plugging a cable into the router and to your studio computer, that then makes it hardwired. We can work with, with with you as long as it fits all the other criteria as well. I should add a safe route of having a cable. I don't want twenty five meters of cable tripping people up and falling down the stairs. Whatever. <laughs> Let's keep it safe, people. Health and safety. We're not here to kill people. But yeah, you know, as long as it's hardwired, as long as as that studio can be made to work. Um, uh, so that we are, and then basically what we do is we're, we're controlling that session. We, we can, with your permission, we just 
get you to link into the IPT, IPDTL port, easy for me to say, then that allows us, we are then controlling everything from our end. We're recording it, we're doing the rock and roll, you're able to concentrate on the narration. Um, the only thing that's different from being in studio or the only thing that should be different from being in studio is you're not the other side of the glass from somebody and you're obviously having to wear cams all the time because you're in um, contact with somebody. Who Can might they see you? Is there video? No, there's that. We, we are looking into developing that for uh, the future, but at the moment, with the um, the bandwidth that the recording takes up anyway, we don't want to have anything else that's that's cutting into that bandwidth, because even though it's hardwired, it's still going across the internet. At I like some that because I dress up. I like to dress up. There you go. Maybe an old theater girl. <laughs> I dress up for the character, and I do mostly like psycho thrillers. So, like, probably I don't want someone thinking I'm weird. <laughs> <laughs> we would never think anybody was weird. People can do what they want to do. And the, the <laughs> beauty of that is you can turn the video camera off. So that's not a problem anyway. But but yeah, at the moment, we don't have that that capability anyway. So it's a case of um, keeping it, you know, it, 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 keep the communication going. But it's it's all verbal, non, non-visual communication. And of course, from an RNIB perspective, that fits in quite well with us as well. We have blind as well as um, sighted producers. So... Um, the, the video element isn't as important for us in that sense, other than, you know, obviously we're aware that the narrator might want to see us when we're communicating. So we'll see how that goes in the future. But as I say, I don't really want to want to get into an area where the, the, the most important part of the signal is the audio part of the, the, the signal. So, you know, and the, there are, you know, there are downsides to it. There are glitches, potentially a few more glitches than you would ever hope to get in a standard studio. But equally, a studio can go down. You could have traveled into London, into central London, got on a tube, suffered a strike, finally got there, got off the tube, got into the studio. And I don't know, the, the mic goes down or whatever, you know, how frustrating would that be? If you've got a glitch and you're doing it from your home studio, Go and get a cup of tea. We'll get it sorted. You'll you'll be the back. The problem up is the location. You're right near yeah. all the really good shopping. So can I just say that every <laughs> single time I ever recorded there, I immediately spent the exact amount that I was being paid before I even. There you go. It. There you go. Well, that's self discipline for you, eh? But uh, lovely. But yeah. <laughs> okay, so I'm really curious. I'd love to do a deep dive on Ooh, what scary. you're listening for and when you're listening to auditions and what makes the difference between because we all audition like 24 hours a day that's like our gig yeah. our gig is yeah, yeah. being rejected a lot yeah, yeah, and yeah, we learn to love the audition do yeah. you have any advice any insight because if anyone you've heard a lot of auditions yeah, yeah. Tell us about it. Tell us what you're listening for, what you hear that you think maybe you wish we understood we wouldn't do or. Yeah. OK. Um, I mean, one of the things I do with auditions is I actually put it back to the auditionee to say, select a piece that you think best reflects your narration style. And that might be cruel uh, or it might seem cruel because it puts somebody into a panic. But it's, a, it, it's done for a reason because I want people to think about why they want to be a narrator and what they think they, what, how they think they might sound. It's not to pigeonhole anybody, but it gives me an understanding of where people think they are at. You know, do they think they're detective voice? Do they think they're nonfiction? Do they think they're whatever they might think they are? Um, and that's then that's quite useful. Sometimes it's it's apparent that somebody's given it no thought at all, and they've just gone right here. You go. I'm going to read this, <laughs> and that's fine because that's fine also. You know, because I'm. Uh, but that first thing, giving that pe people the option to choose their own material, does give some insight because it also gives some insight into what sort of material they know is out there. Do, do they have? Do they read? If you're not a reader excuse me, if you're not a reader of books, not out loud, not a narrator, but if you're not a reader of books, then you're unlikely to really have thought about what a narrator needs to be. And then of course, a narrator needs to be interested in reading books. It's a long job. 
do you get people auditioning that aren't yeah you get people who think because they just think reading is reading though you know of course i can read i can read well, anyone can yeah, do it just talk into your phone. It. exactly <laughs> if you're going to be an eraser you've got to um accept that you know you could be in studio for days and days on end and it's your voice you're going to be hearing for hour and hour and end and if you haven't thought about that, if you haven't thought about how you're going to approach um, the narration, then you've sort of put yourself on the back foot to an extent. So for an audition, I want, I'm listening out for, can I hear, can I hear the subt subtleties? Can I hear the, the thought process? Can I hear that somebody, what some, even if they haven't nailed it, that they've thought about what they're doing. If somebody just comes launching in saying, blah, 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 here's a voice, here's a voice, here's a voice. I'm thinking this person hasn't actually thought about this at all. If I'm hearing, here's some light, here's some shade, here's some subtlety, here's a bit I've chosen that shows that isn't just the first four pages of the book because that's all I could be bothered doing. I've actually thought, well, I wanna do this passage. This shows my skill set. This shows that I understand pacing. I understand um characterization but i understand the subtleties within characterization this character doesn't need to have a special voice but an inflection just showing that they're brittle or they're angry or whatever it may be has come out and those no subtleties those moments just make we go aha this person has thought about this they know what they're doing they can read they, they've got the fluency um, you know, um, obviously, those are all things you're li li listening out for as well. If if somebody stumbled 20 times in the first 30 seconds, it's going to be, yeah, thank you. Sorry. But, you know, because studio time is the most valuable time thing we have. You know, it's yeah. expensive and yeah. we need to maximize uh, in a three hour session. That's what we have. We have two, three hour sessions a day. We need the narrator to be doing 100 recorded minutes or there or thereabouts of usable material in that three hours. So in 180 minutes, they need to be producing around about 100 minutes of recorded, fully recorded, because we rock and roll, you know, okay, there's some tidy up editing, but in the main, what goes down, what's in the can is is the recorded material. That's it. That's, it, that's You quickly learn, you don't you? I remember when I first was with you guys, the first day I realized, Every time I make a mistake, if I apologize, I'm wasting yeah. more of the editor's You're time. You're wasting more time. Yeah, exactly. And it's also potentially taking you out of your zone. Now, yeah. sometimes that's a good thing. Sometimes we, you need to do that. Sometimes you need to reset and, and you know just step back from it and go, hang on a second. I've just got myself caught up in something here. And I don't know why. That's fine. You can talk about it with the producer. We can have a laugh about it. You can go, yeah, okay. That uh, I see why that's not working. This This page, for some reason is different to the rest of the book you know sometimes those things can happen and it's just nice to go ah and then you can get back to it but equally if it's just a flub if you're a flub as you call it fluff as i call it but either way if it's just a simple mistake just go again you know by the time you've apologized we've already wound the tape back and we're playing you back in again and you're gone you know you, you, you've got to be on it and that's the movement that we're having and the ideal is you're doing more than 100 but if if you're not doing the 100 recorded minutes if you're not doing 50 or 60 pages in a session then you're not going to cut it so those are the other you know those are things i'm looking out for even if somebody if somebody's sent me a uh, I do virtual auditions these days, and so I ask people to record it in their own time, but I want to hear the whole thing. Uh, you, it's not an edited thing. I've got to hear that that entire piece. In the old days, I used to have um, people come in. We'd have a whole day of auditions, for instance, you know, and those would be tiring, and there would be small slots allocated to people. And there was one narrator, I won't, I won't name him, who was... 25 minutes late i mean I, I had a half an hour slot for him you know he was 25 minutes late. it turned out it was something to do with the tube you know fair enough but in my head i'm i'm going well that's him but he's toast i can't you know that's rude that's unreliable blah 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 he walked in he sat down he started reading within 10 seconds i knew he was an unbelievably brilliant narrator and he is one of the most uh, he, you know, it was the first time he'd done anything narration-wise, but he was a natural. 
now he he, he he gets a lot of work. He's out there, you know, he, he probably reads more than anybody in the world, but that's, but he had that very special, everything was there already. I don't expect to see that. That was just a, yeah, I love you. You're, you're in but whatever. Also, also the hundred minutes when you say the, um, and I'm, and I just want to say this for the video for people that could be watching this, that are just starting audio books. Yep. Time in the studio and time with a director is an entirely different thing than time on your own in the booth. And you'll find yeah. that you can easily, I can easily do like a whole book in two days in the studio. Whereas if I'm home, I, I can do it, but it is painful and brutal if you're doing the producing yeah. and editing yourself. So, so if you hear, you've got to do a hundred minutes, you've got to do and you're new and that feels like a yeah. lot because you've gone in and every word you've said has felt like it's really hard. Don't worry about that. It's we'll different. Yeah. yeah, it's yeah, yeah. different if absolutely. you've got someone plugged absolutely. in and they're with you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Totally, properly, yes, well said. And of course I'm thinking it from the, the studio perspective and-, and um, I've got yeah. the home studio girl. Yes, exactly. And times. I totally get that and I, you know, I get, and of course, I get the paranoia of it and, and the, the stress of thinking you've then got to edit it as well. That's the beauty of if you're working with a studio, of course, yeah. we're doing the, you know, rock and roll, we're editing as we go. If we were doing it fluff and repeat, we're actually, you know, editing it down later. But of course, that takes up a lot of post-production time. So with fluff and repeat, that, that's where the big advantage of rock and roll yeah. is in, in that you are, you're probably slightly longer in studio than if you were doing it fluff and repeat. But the once you're done, you're done. You've got your 13 hours of, of finished recording, basically. Um, from an R and I B perspective, we then need to put that through a slightly different process to turn it into a talking book, which needs to be navigable. It, it has um, an HTML side to it. I won't bore you with all the the insights there. But so there's just other having things that need someone to go listen. On. I'm sorry, I keep interrupting but, you, but just having no, no, it's fine. You, it's a conversation. We're allowed, you know. It's cool. <laughs> but yeah, no, that's the whole thing. That somebody listening, somebody, yeah. somebody was there. You've got a pair of ears. Before you go faster. The, to bounce and to bounce back to not make you have to rethink yourself yeah. good narrators will think those things but then they need to let that go and trust the ap to be the person to bring it up for them there's a, the, another narrator she's absolutely fantastic she's wonderful i love her to bits but she has a perfect ear for hearing the errors but they're sometimes overly perfect you know it's what you did was brilliant and yes, you've now stopped yourself to redo the thing. And it's even more brilliant. But what you did was absolutely fine. Trust us, we will get you. you and, you, you know, suddenly. You can't do that. You can't do that level of perfection for an audiobook. And it's what Kim said yeah. earlier, but it's still our whole conversation. This applies to Kim. She said, once again, everything boils down to being connected to the story. And yes, if you're absolutely. the details, I can't, yeah. I'll go crazy. That's why I'm not. I'm not great. I'm not one of those people who can do a zillion accents perfectly because I can't yeah. sit in the booth and be thinking about my R's and my trills. Yeah. I'm exactly. And I would always say to, to my and and obviously there are different styles, there are different requirements, and and as I said before, each book will sort of talk to you to to an extent anyway and tell you what it needs as long as you've prepped it. But at the same time, um I work on the basis less less is more. I want the characters to breathe and for it to be apparent who's speaking when, but you can do a lot of that through inflection or if there's a character voice that you think, well, I'm not strong on that that kind of accent, don't do that accent. Do a, Maybe do a little hint towards that accent, but don't bog yourself down with that one tiny character who's going to kibosh your whole recording. You're this brilliant you don't artist. You want a 10-hour animation. Who, Exactly. You're not, you know, if, if if it was a radio drama, there would be lots of actors doing it. It's not a, you, you are a storyteller, you are the narrator, you need to bring the listener in. And in order to do that, they need to trust that you know what you're doing. And if you're flailing around with accents all over the place, and, and, and it becomes a let's listen to the accents show, you know, it yeah. needs to be 
you you need to to trust that you know if you're in studio you've got the trust of the producer as well to sit there and help guide you through that if you're doing it for yourself you've got to trust yourself that you are doing the the job you're doing the job properly you're, you've you've thought about it and this is why you're doing it and you're not going to get bogged down with the accents and the and the look how clever i am and i can do this and you know it's tell the story, story. If you haven't told the story, you haven't done the job. And, you know, and, 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 but as a listener, and of course, you'll get different comments. You don't try not to read the comments on, on Audible or wherever, you know, to, try not to take them too much to heart or take from it what you can and from a positive perspective. Some people are looking for, some people want lots of accents. They want that sort of rammed home kind of narration. Other people want subtlety. You can't please everybody all of the time but what you can do is be true to yourself and be true to the book be true to the material and so read it be gentle with it be gentle with yourself be, you know but but be honest as well if you if you haven't done that bit right you're gonna do it again you know because it's better to better to say right okay I can, I can use that as a learning experience and I'm gonna redo that page and and get that right and spend that little bit of time particularly if you're new to it to read out loud at home you know be honest with yourself you know if, if particularly the the people who are new to it even if you haven't been cast to a job find something read it read it out loud be honest with yourself was that a stumble if it was a stumble you'll be stopped for it so you know read it again read it again keep going until you've practiced through and and you feel comfortable so that you can walk into a studio or into your home studio or wherever and go yeah I can read this and because, I can do it because you've listened in the time to that makes the economic, because you've listened to yourself. Yeah. And also yeah. to, uh, can I interject the, this choose? I, I find a lot of people don't even think about this choosing where you get your feedback from your sources, like listen to a casting director, like a Rupert, listen, then at the end of the day, listen to yourself, hire a coach that is a coach. Like, Try to maybe check the coach before you hire it them and see mm. if they've actually done an audiobook. You know, and yeah. but then people read their reviews. They jump in, then they go and I have somebody that a partner, every month we check each other's reviews. And if there is a consistent theme that we need to know about, we will in yeah. a professional way let the other person know. I don't need to know what some upset person not happy with their life thinks or what their opinion is. Yeah. It's, I don't want to know. I don't need that because I just think people don't even, they just take any opinion on as if it's yeah. gospel. And yeah. yeah, no, and it's very important. It's, it's it, you know, it, as you say, if there's a recurring theme, yeah. you know, then maybe that's a note for yourself to go, right, okay. And, and, and if you've got a trusted advisor or a coach, as you say, or somebody, um, you know, other narrators who whose work you respect talk those things through and that's the beauty of if you're in studio with the audio producer say what what is it why do i get this what what's good but some of the reviews just take them and ignore them they're, 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 quite often you know i'll see i don't know um it gets everybody gets a one star you know it, it's one star it's one star performance one star reading one star for the book or, or overall whatever and then you, if you read the reviews, it's just they hated the book and they'll go, the narrator was brilliant. But, oh, well, why have you given them a one star then? You know, they deserve better than that. Sometimes it's they didn't like the book. Sometimes they were in a bad mood. Sometimes blah, blah, blah. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes it was badly yeah. read, you know. And so you've got to be honest with that as well. And, and, and we all get things wrong. And, and it's a case of, you know, the publishers want their book to sound as good as the best it can, can sound. The, the author absolutely wants that. The publishers want it to sound good because they want sales. And of course, you know, there's, there's a commercial element to all that. And so therefore they want to know that the, there are narrators they can trust. However, they also want to bring new people through because they want to have new voices. Well, those new voices might be new and need to learn some of those skills, you know, so sometimes the books won't sound as good, but if then they get destroyed on um yeah. you know on the, the reviews you know I, I i take it back to my first love the first question the what about football the, the you know me talking about my you know following my football team my soccer team 
you know, if you bring a new player through, you've got to allow them to make mistakes. You know, they're not always going to be perfect. You've got to protect you give the, the artist's room... soul. Exactly. You've got to protect the soul. Exactly that. And if you give them the room to protect them, to be protected and to learn, and as long as the artist is exactly that and, and wants to learn within their art and not be sensitive too, too overly sensitive to that, then collaboratively, and again, I take it back to that collaboration, you you know, and it doesn't have to be with an audio producer in studio. It could be with a friend, with a trusted ally, um, but somebody who can just guide you to being a, a better narrator, and, yeah. and 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 allow you to forgive yourself for getting that one wrong. You know, don't don't get hung up on it, but do go right. I didn't get that right, but I I can yeah. learn from that. Be honest, and, then, well, you, and be honest, and and so as I say, you know, it might sound crazy to walk around the house reading out loud to yourself, but if you're honest with yourself about what worked and what didn't work, it's all part of the improvement process. Yeah, and, and then and I did follow for, I think, the first six months I followed my Glaswegian husband around the house imitating everything he said until <laughs> I was told that there is a possible divorce in, <laughs> if I don't stop. <laughs> yeah, well, obviously... Obviously, be true to yourself, but also be true to those around you. Yes, so, you know. <laughs> don't be. Um, no, be I've, got, I've got Sarah. I've got something from Sarah real quick, and then we've got um, a final question that I like to ask. Um, cool. Nobody gets off the hook from so. But um, <laughs> Sarah mentioned the issue I now have with going back into record is the sheer number of hours you have to record in a small window. I've adopted a more paced recording style in my own studio, which allows me to keep my voice in good shape for other VO and singing work. I adore working with a director. It is the best, but I found it really hard to transition back to in-house recordings. I've never yeah. been self-directed from home. Oh, so the question, are you able to work in half-day time slots remotely with actors, or is that simply too much of a faff? As a prolific audio describer as well, thank you. To you, thanks to you, Rupert. I am incredibly passionate about accessibility and would love to record for you again. Oh, well, that's very sweet. And we would love Sarah to come work with us again. That's fine. Yes. So what we do is we have, um, so we do half day sessions. Ideally, we, you know, you would be booked in for a three hour session. If you can do two in a day, great, because obviously that that's, there's a simpler element to that. But yes, we do. So three hour sessions, 9.30 till 12.30 or 1.30 till 4.30. Um, and if you can do both, great. And yes, the home recording can be done in that. And also, right voice, right job will fit round if you, you know, if it needs to be a slightly shorter session or a slightly longer session, as long as everybody can fit round, brilliant, we'll make it work. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, but we get there in the end, generally. And I was on a book with Sarah, oh my God, that voice. So, <laughs> final question. She's good. Yes, very good. Okay. For this YouTube audience that is going to be watching are going to be watching this 60 70 80 years from now if you could leave them with one thing one piece of advice one thing if anything they take away from this call what would you like it to be one piece of narration advice narration life uh, oh okay. jokes, life anything anything, anything, anything. Oh, them to remember oh i wish i could do the humorous joke i'm just rubbish at jokes <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, so what we, RNIB, you can see it on that screen behind me. One of the things we're pushing for at the moment and, and we're um, total um, passionate advocates of is to make this world a better place, a, a more perfect place for blind and partially sighted people. If that means it's a perfect place for everybody, brilliant, because blind and partially sighted people are exactly that. They are people. So if we're doing this, if somebody's watching this in 80 years time, and the world is a better place for blind and partially sighted people, and it is perfect, then, then that's great. But if we haven't got to that perfection, let's keep pushing towards that. Let's, let's keep being kind to people, each other. Let's think about accessibility. Let's not close down ticket, ticket offices in train stations unnecessarily. Let's you know, think that if, if, if I couldn't see to get here, how would I do it? Oh, I don't know. Let's, let's think these things through. And so I think if I... If I was to leave you one thing, it would be to, to yes, let's try and, and make this world a, a better place and start with audiobooks. Lots of blind and partially sighted people are, are, are very confident, outgoing, 
uh, successful people. And then other people are coming to sight loss later in life or suddenly or experiencing, you know, a shock diagnosis and they need help. They need time. They need consideration. They need support. They need, you know, whatever the NHS or whatever, wherever you are in the world and you, whatever um, health service is available to help people get through that and find their path and find what they need. And there needs to be services like the talking book service to there to, to bring some joy as well. You know, some of the, the some of the light, some of the happiness, you know, some of it's going to be about um, getting a diagnosis and moving forward and finding help and services that are fundamental to day to day life. And then there are other things which are about, you know, reading is, is, a, is a leisure and a pleasure experience, but everybody needs that. Everybody needs to have the right to that pleasure. And, you know, it's great that there's there's now more audiobooks out there than w there ever were. You know, there's now a, a marketplace for them, and that's made all the publishers very keen to get involved. We work with a lot of brilliant publishers. We've got some great partnerships with all the big publishers and they're, they're great and they understand what we're doing and they're on board with that and, and we thank them for that but at the same time a lot of the you know if the material isn't available through libraries for for people who can get them for free then then you know accessibility doesn't just come in in uh you know it could, what am i trying to say if if you can't afford to get it from a market an open marketplace then it's still not accessible to you so having a, 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 blind, a library for blind and partially sighted people is a vital thing. And you know, everybody feeding into that service is a wonderful thing. And do you, helps do you have to be in whole. the UK to audition for you? Do, do you have to be in the UK to audition for me? No, we can, we can use people outside of the country. Uh, I think there are certain regulations that I can't even remember what the, the internet are. It tends to be easier if we use UK based narrators in the main but open to talk to people but obviously different countries will have you know america has its own version or versions yeah. i think of what we do so you know if you're in a different country go talk to them and and, and put your wonderful skills to, to helping them thank you so much for your time Rupert. Well, thank you this would be a wonderful call there wasn't even enough time to even touch on all the questions and i'm so grateful that you you joined us well, thank you very much. Thank you for, for inviting me. Hope I haven't witted too much and bored everybody senseless. It was but, amazing. Um, it was amazing. By the time the edit comes down, it'll be down to 10 minutes. She'll, uh... No, 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 no. <laughs> nope, not much editing on this one. So this was wonderful. I didn't say anything inappropriate, which is new. <laughs> <laughs> I probably did, but we'll see. Nope, I think I think we're, we're good to go. This has been wonderful, and I'm so grateful. It, it's such a... I don't think I would be a narrator today if it wasn't for you and the RNIB. And well, that's very kind of you to say. And I'm glad you found your path and I'm glad you're doing what you're doing. And everybody else out there, I hope you're enjoying what you do as well. That's the other thing. Enjoy it. You know, narration is a great thing, but you, you, the more you enjoy it, the more that enjoyment will come out in, in the productions as well. So that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Rupert. Thank, Thank you. you, everyone, for joining. It's been fabulous. Thank you all. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>